Hello everybody, uh, my name is Eric Durier and I work at the Light uh, Source at Brookhaven uh, National Lab. I've been working here for about uh, 15 years and uh, looking at uh, many, many different things using uh, synchrotron radiation techniques. And uh, today I'm going to take you on a journey uh, for some work I did on an uh, ancient uh, pigment. So that uh, uh, pigment's uh, uh, name is uh, Maya Blue, and the reason being Maya Blue is a pigment that was extensively used by the Mayas in Mexico, and that was between the 8th and uh, the 19th century. And uh, Maya Blue was uh, found in uh, uh, many, uh, many uh, places on mural paintings, on uh, uh, statues and ceramics and codices, also textiles. So it's been extensively used in a number of places for, for, for many, many uh, centuries. So the, um, it has been a mystery in the sense that this pigment even now still has a very bright color, a very uh, blue, uh, blue uh, a very uh, uh, contrasted blue color, a very strong color. And this has been like this for hundreds of years, even though the pigment uh, has been exposed to humid conditions, harsh conditions in the tropical uh, forest. So the mystery of this pigment, uh, th this pigment's remarkable stability sparked a lot of interest for a long time. It was quite uh, uh, puzzling why is this color still so lively uh, nowadays. So initially Maya Blue was thought to be a blue mineral. Uh, so several groups started to look, to, to look at, into this and were using synchrotron radiation techniques in order to uncover the secret of this fantastic uh, pigment. So we did some reverse engineering of the Maya Blue and what was found that is that in reality Maya Blue is a complex, a sort of composite mater material and it's formed of a dye that is extracted from a plant whose name is Indigo Ferra and then the other part of it, the other ingredient, is a clay, uh, mostly paligorskite, that is commonly, commonly found in the Utah, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So, Maya Blue is not a mineral, but was manufactured. So probably by chance, I mean, it was this uh, mixture between a plant, uh, the indigotine, and the clay, just washing the, washing the, the plant into the clay. There was this uh, encounter or this mixing between both ingredients. But also there was probably a lot of uh, ingenuity, human ingenuity back then, because if the indigo and the clay are just mixed up together, uh, they do not form a very, uh, a very uh, resistant uh, pigment. So one really needs to cook both ingredients, the vegetal powder and the mineral powder, making a sort of brew or concoction in order to get the, uh, the, the final, uh, final pigment. And eventually the process was also intentional for that blue pigment uh, to be uh, uh, used on a, on a large scale on many artifacts and walls and, uh, and monuments for many, many hundreds of years. So uh, there, was to be, there needed to be a recipe to prepare this uh, pigment in a reliable and, uh, and reproducible manner. So what we did is we were trying to uh, uh, come up with a modern analog, the first modern analog of this uh, Maya Blue. So um, uh, we, were, we wanted to mimic the Maya Blue and essentially trying to leverage the synergy between the uh, vegetal color and the mineral uh, stability. So for this to happen, we had a number of specifications. We wanted this pigment to be very stable, able to be resistant in harsh conditions, uh, we wanted this mineral to be natural, made of non-toxic ingredients uh, uh, at low cost. And also this uh, pigment uh, um, whose color should be tunable. Okay? So depending on the concentration of the dye, dye you can get a very uh, uh, deep blue or light blue. So we needed to control that as well as the uniformity, uniformity of the dye across, uh, across the material. So these were the specifications and we were trying to make a new pigment uh, from uh, on that basis. So how does it work? For Maya Blue to endure uh, the heat and humidity of the Yucatan forests, uh, we realized that two factors are essential. First thing is the porosity, so the uh, uh, morphology of the pigment at the nanometer length scale. We need to have pores or voids or channels 
for the indigo molecules to be able to sit in and stay and take shelter, so to speak, inside, inside the, the mineral. And the second parameter is the temperature. Uh, we need to remove the moist, or take the water out of the clay, in order to facilitate the migration of the molecules inside the emptied uh, channels. So we want to design a modern material that is based on those principles and that behaves exactly like the, like the Maya blue. So it turns out, uh, this turns out to be a very uh, challenging problem, a difficult problem. And in order to understand that better, I'm going to make an analogy between my pigment and uh, trucks in town. Okay, so let's consider we have trucks moving through and parking along the streets in a urban area. And we assume that we, have a, we want to have a lot of people moving in in the same neighborhood uh, in one day. Okay, so how is this going to be uh, possible? So here's an analogy. Okay, I have my molecules and the channels, a bit like the trucks along the streets and I want to see how I can, uh, I can get the trucks all over the area and the, those trucks park, uh, park, in the street, park, park, park in the streets. So the, the, the goal here is really to park as many trucks as possible uh, and everywhere in the neighborhood, okay? So again, back in, my, uh, in the world of the pigment, I want to have a high and a uniform concentration of the dye molecules inside, inside the channels. Okay, so um, in reality what happens is that the streets really get jammed up, okay? So the picture you see here is not realistic. It's not gonna happen. There's no way you can have the trucks all over the place like this. The reason being is that there are impossible turns. The trucks are unable to pass each other. Streets will get blocked. Intersections will get blocked. So there's no way you can have the trucks uh, occupying the entire, entire neighborhood like this, okay? So this picture is not realistic. So how are we gonna how are we going to improve this situation here? Uh, we can make the streets larger, wider, but if we do so, then the trucks have a tendency to just to go too fast and, 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 and drive through the neighborhood, and it's going to be difficult to park the trucks, okay? So essentially, it's going to be difficult to trap the molecules in the channels if the channels are too big. Okay, so another idea is let's try to have a wide avenue, okay? So something similar like the William Floyd Parkway, going through the, uh, the town of Shirley. This is on Long Island, nearby the lab. So we had the traffic that flows freely along the, uh, the, the parkway, along the avenue. And from there, the parks can, can park, the, the trucks, sorry, the trucks can park on the uh, adjacent uh, streets. So this is what you see here. All the adjacent streets are occupied because the trucks could just get there. But now if you look at uh, the uh, streets further out, far from the parkway, those streets are emptied because uh, the, 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 park, the, 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 the trucks cannot go that far, okay? So we're in a situation here where the concentration of the trucks is very non-uniform. We have a lot of trucks along the parkway, but the other streets are, are still uh, empty. So this is not good. Uh, we want to have no, we have to, want to have a uniform distribution of the trucks uh, across the area. So we came up with the idea, okay, for this uh, to happen, maybe we need more avenues, more parkways uh, through the town. And essentially we divide the town into smaller blocks where we have the streets as well as many avenues. And that's exactly what we see in, the, in New York City, for example, okay, where we have those different blocks and avenues and streets. And then we, we can populate the entire town in a more, more efficient way. So this is exactly what's happening with the pigment. That's exactly what we want to achieve. So the material equivalent is that we want to have a grainy mat material, a powder. So for the, uh, uh, for the molecules to be able to access those grains, so these are the surfaces, my avenues, and then from there, from the surfaces, the molecules will be able to enter the grains, will be able to go along the streets further inside the, uh, inside the town. Okay, so, we want to optimize the material design. We have a number of parameters to consider for this to happen. Number one is the morphology of the nanometer scale. We need the porous materials, so for the molecules to sit in the channels in the voids. Number two is the morphology at the, at the micrometer length scale. And we want to have a finely divided material made of small, uh, small grains. So let's sit on that particular parameter for, 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 for a couple of seconds. Uh, this is key, the grain size is key. If you have grains that are too small, molecules will mostly be around the grains or over the surfaces, and then will be easily get washed out, okay? So the pigment is not durable. The other way around, if the grains are too big, 
the molecules will not be able to uh, enter the core of the grains and we end up with a, a concentration of the color that is not uniform and the concentration that is too low. So therefore, we cannot achieve the right blue uh, 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 color. The pigment is not usable. So this is a bit, uh, this is a, a difficult requirement. We have to uh, try to find ways to, of doing this. Uh, we have also steric constraints. We need to have the size of the molecules match the size of the channels. We need to have a strong affinity between the molecules and the channels, the substrate, the, the mineral, for the molecules to bind to the substrate. And then finally, dynamics is an important thing, okay? We, we prepare the pigment by heating up the mixture. We do this concoction, this brew. So as a function of temperature, the molecules tend to move. So how do we fixate the molecules in the, in the material? Okay, so for, for ta tackling that scientific question, you see there are many uh, challenges and many requirements. We put together a big team that you see here. Uh, it was a large collaboration with many different experts across the board. And the uh, big credit goes to, uh, cred uh, to Catherine Dejoie. Uh, she's the first name on that list uh, because she was doing her PhD uh, uh, work at that time on this uh, very uh, subject. So we've been working on a, on a variety of samples, looking at archaeological specimens, as well as synthetic analogs. And we were using a, a large set of techniques, including neutron beams and synchrotron radi radiation beams. So what did we do? We looked at all sorts of uh, porous materials, the like clays and silicates and others. We also tried different uh, routes of synthesis. This is a two-phase problem, okay? We have the, 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 the dye and we have the mineral. So we tried the solid-solid synthesis, we tried a solid-liquid synthesis, so many different recipes, as well as we were using extensively a number of characterization techniques, including synchrotron radiation. So what did we find? Uh, in the vast majority of cases, the material was, uh, that we synthesized failed. So you see here an example where the blue color degrades, so blue turns into yellow, and the nitric uh, acid attack. So the, the, the pigment is not stable at all. So we tried many, many different systems. This is here another one, another system, another mineral. Uh, the mineral is porous. You see those cavities and, and voids and everything. But still, if we try to um, uh, test the stability of the, of, the, of the pigment, you see that the blue turns yellow. This is not good. And eventually, after many trials, we, end up with, we ended up with this particular uh, mineral. It's an aluminosilicate, uh, the name is zeolite, and with this particular zeolite, we're able to get, get the good results. So you see here, even under a very aggressive nitric as, uh, attack, uh, nit uh, ni ni uh, nitric acid attack, still the material is very stable. So we were happy with this, and uh, what we found is that the color is very fragile until we could figure out a recipe, an efficient way to encapsulate the organic dye inside the, inside the mineral. So we got our system, we have now indigo, not in a clay anymore, but indigo in a different uh, silicate, okay? This is our analog, our modern material. And then uh, here's a picture of uh, a uh, setup, an experiment we did uh, at the NSLS2, uh, where we were looking at this, uh, at this material. So what is interesting here, we start from the material at room temperature, the structure is A, and then we heat it up, okay? We just uh, raise the temperature, and then the material by itself transforms from A into B. Okay, so we have a new structure, B. And then when we cool this, uh, this material back down to room temperature, uh, the material reverse, reverse, reverses to A. So we have now the sequence A to B to A, okay? So in that particular case, there is no indigo inside the structure, okay? So it's just the pure silicate, the pure mineral, no, uh, no doping. So in that particular case, the material transforms A to B and then B to A as a function of temperature. Now, if we do the exact same temperature, the exact same experiment, we start from the, the zeolite in the A state, the A phase, we heat it up with indigo, and then we transform, the material transforms into B, okay, we go from A to B. But then when we go back to room temperature, now the material doesn't go back to, to A, you see, it stays B. So now we have the sequence A to B and still it stays B. And this is a very convincing evidence that the molecules now are inside the structure and locks the structure, so the material cannot revert, revert back to A, it stays B. So we have a, 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 a very direct clue using a synchrotron, synchrotron beam, a very direct clue as to 
the indigo entering the channels and being blocked in the, in the channels. So once we know that, we were trying to locate the indigo molecules inside the substrate, inside the zeolite, using a synchrotron beam. That's another experiment we did, and we were able to uh, see the location of the molecules uh, uh, inside the straight channels, as well as at the intersections of the other channels inside the, uh, the material. Okay, so we were very happy, very successful. I think we managed to uh, produce the first analog of the Maya blue pigment. We were using a methodology uh, to, to, to get there. It took, it took many steps and a lot of trials, a lot of uh, uh, experiments, a lot of modeling, but eventually we got there. And I think in the future, this methodology can be used to propose the design for other, what we call archaeomimetic materials, so ana uh, uh, modern analogs of archaeological materials. So here's the story, okay? So in the past, we had this Maya blue. This is the indigo inside the clay. What I was talking about today is an analog of that. So this is now still the indigo, the same, uh, the same dye, but in a different mineral, in a zeolite, okay? So that's the, the analog we managed to, uh, to work on. And then moving forward, what is interesting is now is that there are people looking at the same mineral, this zeolite, but with other uh, uh, guests, other uh, uh, dopants. And it looks like maybe this uh, particular material has some potential to be used for the sequestration of a uh, well-known greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide. So there is an ongoing, ongoing work uh, at the NSLS2 to look at that particular system with applications uh, uh, for the future. So we see the whole story here from back in the 8th century, starting the Yucatan, uh, Yucatan uh, Peninsula all the way to uh, to um, uh, current, uh, current uh, uh, technologies and current problems. To finish off, uh, if you're interested in that sort of approach, uh, using synchrotron radiation on archaeological materials, more stories can be, find, can be found with SR2A, so where SR2A stands for synchrotron radiation in art and archaeology. And you see here there was a, um, a uh, the last venue of this uh, conference, uh, SR2A, was in uh, Stanford, uh, back in 2021. 20, uh, so I hope I was able to showcase the important contribution of synchrotron radiation to the study of ancient materials and moving into uh, uh, moving to uh, new materials. And I thank you very much for your for your attention. <laughs>